Greetings, everyone. Learning is a hobby here. Uh, I wanted to do uh, today uh, sections 1.1 .1 to 1.4 in this book by John Stilwell, one of my favorite authors, Elements of Number Theory, which I promised you guys I would do. Um, so I'm not going to finish chapter one in this video, but I am going to do several. The sections are kind of short, so I'm going to do several of them. I'll do 1.1 .1 to 1.4, and then you know we'll finish up uh, chapter one in the next video that I do uh, after I do the exercise sets <laughs> for those sections. Um, so I just wanted to um, get started on this book because like I said uh, in a previous video, I wanted to do this book in tandem with uh, this book, Elementary Cryptanalysis, that we're working through on the channel as well, just to give you some background in not, not, you know, the number theory stuff that uh, you might want to know for, for doing elementary cryptanalysis. So uh, let's start with that. Um, and also just to be annoying for a second, uh, I will put the, the link to the Patreon page down below if you guys want to support the channel uh, by donating uh, $5 a month uh, to the Patreon account. Um, for that, you, you get uh, prerequisite material um, by me. Um, you know, the prerequisite material meaning, you know, stuff that you need to know f to do the math on the actual YouTube channel. Uh, and right now we finished, uh, we just finished chapter three in the Blitzer Algebra book. So uh, check it, check that out if it sounds interesting to you. Um, for the price of a cup of coffee a month, $5 a month, uh, you'll have access to all of that content. So, all right, commercial aside, let's get to the notes for this. <clears throat> Okay, so here's the notes. Like I said, I'm going to do 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, .1 .1 and 1.4 in this video. So he starts with, uh, you know, this is uh, elements of number theory. So we start with the, the usual set of natural numbers. So the natural numbers you hopefully are <laughs> quite familiar with is the set of counting numbers. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, goes on forever. Uh, that's what the set that we call the natural numbers. We also use, use this... Um, uh, symbol here to denote the set of natural numbers because it's such an important set. And um, there are a couple of operations that we'll talk about that you can do to natural numbers uh, here, which are uh, addition and multiplication. So we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. <clears throat> okay, you can define uh, the natural numbers recursively. So by starting with the natural number one, and to get to from one natural number to the next natural number, all you have to do is add one to it. So if you want to get the J plus first natural number, you just take the Jth natural number and you add one to it, all right? So this, this is sort of like a recursive relation for getting all of the natural numbers. Um, or you can think of this as sort of like an inductive definition, I guess. <clears throat> okay. Uh, there's a, a bunch of definitions that we're going to look at here. So the first, uh, next the definition here is about division. So let A and N be natural numbers. We say that A divides N, which is written this way, uh, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, this is read A divides N, um, or A is a divisor of N, or A is a factor of N. Uh, if and only if N equals A times B for some uh, natu other natural number B. And so that's what we mean by divides. <clears throat> okay, and once we start talking about factoring no, uh, natural numbers, we get to the concept of primes. A natural number P is called prime if the only natural numbers that divide P are P and one, so one in itself. Okay, and then we get to our first theorem here, which uh, was known in antiquity to the ancient Greeks um, and is proved in Euclid's Elements. Uh, this is, the theorem uh, states the infinitude of primes. So the primes are a uh, very important set in number theory um, because they, in some sense, they're like the building blocks of all of the natural numbers. Uh, and it's the sequence of, natu of uh, primes in the set of natural numbers. Uh, have an elusive, I guess, an elusive pattern to them. It's we don't really know what the pattern is. It's it's not clear if you look at the sequence, if there even is a, a like a function that will give you the you know every um, prime number. 
but it turns out that there are an infinite number of them, which is not an obvious thing when you look at the uh, you know a finite number of terms in the sequence of primes. Uh, let's just state the theorem and prove it. So given any primes p1, p2, up to pk, we can always find another prime p. So in other words, the primes are, are infinite, right? There's an infinite number of them. Uh, no finite set of primes is sufficient to get every natural number. <clears throat> so here's the proof. Uh, it's a, an inductive proof uh, by descent. So let's start here. Uh, we start by defining this number in a clever way. So the number n will define as the product of the k primes that we have up here plus 1. So this, you may not be familiar with this symbol here. This just means uh, product. So this is just shorthand for saying the number P1 times P2 times P3 dot, 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 up to PK plus one. So that's what this number N represents. Okay, so we've defined that number. Uh, one nice feature of that number is none of those primes that we just, that we, uh, took as our set of primes, p1 through pk, divide that number n, because if you divide uh, that the number n by any of those primes, you get a remainder of 1. So p all of those numbers, p1, p2, all those primes, p1, p2, up to pk, are not divisors of the number n, okay, for any j equal 1 to k. Then either n itself is prime, which means that we found a new prime, n would be the, the new prime p. Otherwise, n factors into a product of smaller um, uh, smaller natural numbers, A times B, right, for some A, B, and N. Uh, then, sorry, this is a, I just realized there's a typo here. <clears throat> Let me see if I can fix the typo real quick so that, oops, so that I don't have something that's incorrect written here. This zero should be a one. Um, looks like my computer's freezing up. I don't know if, okay, my computer froze up there for a second. So hopefully the video didn't freeze, but anyway, let me fix this. So this should be a one here. All right. So, uh, where the numbers a and B are great, strictly greater than one and strictly less than N. Then, if one of those factors is prime, then you know that. Let's say, just for the sake of uh, con concreteness, let's say A is prime. Then A would be our new prime P. Okay. If not, then we can continue by factoring the numbers A and B themselves. Um, so you know, A would factor into a product of two distinct, uh, two uh, not necessarily distinct, but smaller natural numbers. And same thing could be said for B. Right. However, this pro that process can't go on forever, and the reason for that is the natural numbers are a well-defined set, meaning that uh, there is a small cell natural number n. So the the uh, process of factoring has to terminate in a finite number of steps with a factor of one. So whatever the other factor is, there would have to be at least one other prime as a factor. So that number would be the the new prime p. All right, so um, that's the end of the proof. This is a descent argument because uh, we're using the fact that um, n has a least element, okay? So that proves that the, the set of primes is an infinite set. Okay? There's no, uh, th there's no finite collection of primes that uh, will give us every natural number. Okay, um, that's basically section 1.1. I'll do the, sec the exercise sets for these uh, after I make this video. So I'm going to go through the summary of 1.1 to 1.4 first, and then I'll do the summary. Uh, then I'll do the exercises for these sections in another video. All right, so section 1.2 continues with the theme. Uh, the method used in the proof in the last theorem is called the method of descent, and it's a version of the method of induction. Uh, and the reason that descent works is that uh, the, the natural number the set of natural numbers is what we call well ordered. If you don't know what that means, uh, we went over induction and well ordering in the Spivak book. I think it was chapter two. So uh, if you want to go back and look at those videos, we we talked about that stuff in depth in, in that 
in that book. But anyway, uh, he he gives a reason for that here. Descent works since for any natural number n, we can reach n by starting at one and repeatedly adding one until we reach n in a finite number of steps, right? Um, so if you go backwards, then it has to halt in a finite number of steps too. So we can go backwards from n and eventually we're going to hit one. So, or a smallest element. Doesn't necessarily have to be one, but that process of going backwards would have to finite, uh, terminate in a finite number of steps. Okay, we also have ascent style proofs by induction. Uh, and again, we've actually gone over induction in the Spivak book in chapter two. Again, so I direct you there if you want to see some of that stuff more in depth. Uh, the way that a, a proof by induction works is you have a base step. So you start with the, like the least element and show that the proposition holds for that. And then you use uh, the assumption that the proposition holds for some natural number n and use that to show that it holds for the next natural number n plus one. That's called the inductive step. So we have an example of uh, an inductive, an ascent style induction proof down here. So here's a proposition. For all natural numbers k, 3 divides k cubed plus 2k. So we're going to prove this by an ascent style induction proof, uh, as opposed to a descent style induction proof like we had for uh, the infinitude of primes theorem. OK, so we the proof is by induction on the number k, on the, the uh, parameter k. So uh, the base step is k equals 1. So let's check that it works for k equals 1. So if you, we look at the number 1 cubed plus 2 times 1, that is certainly equal to 3. And 3 is divide, div, uh, divisible by 3, right? It goes in once. Uh, so that shows that 3 divides the number 1 cubed plus 2 times 1, right? So the base step is satisfied. Step 2 is the inductive step. And the inductive step always starts with the inductive hypothesis, meaning that you assume that it holds for some natural number. And then you use that fact to show that it holds for the next natural number. So here we'll start with our inductive hypothesis. Assume 3 divides k cubed plus 2k for some natural number k. Then there in what that means is there exists an integer n such that k cubed plus 2k is equal to 3n. And then we want to consider the next number of that form, k plus 1 cubed plus 2 times k plus 1. Okay, and then what I did there was I just you know multiplied everything out and rearranged some terms. So when you multiply out, you get k cubed plus 3k squared plus 3k plus 1 plus 2k plus 2. And then uh, combining the constants and then just rearranging a couple of the terms here. Uh, that's the same thing as uh, k cubed plus 2k plus 3k squared plus 3k plus 3. And by the inductive hypothesis, we know that this number is divisible by uh, 3. So I can write it as 3 times n. Okay, so this simplifies to 3n plus 3k squared plus 3k plus 3. Uh, this equality is by induction hy hypothesis. All right, and notice 3 is a factor of all those numbers, so we can factor out the 3. And that leaves us with this expression here, 3 times n plus k squared plus k plus 1. And furthermore, this number n plus k squared plus k plus 1 is an integer. In fact, it's a natural number because we're dealing with natural numbers here. Um, but we know that because when you add uh, natural numbers to e each other, you get natural numbers. When you s multiply natural numbers together, you get natural numbers. So that, ter that extra factor is a, a natural number, which means that 3 divides the number that we started with, which was the k plus 1 cubed plus 2 times k plus 1. All right, so the both the base step and the inductive step are satisfied. That means that the property holds for all natural numbers by the, the principle of mathematical induction. And that's it. So that's uh, hopefully you guys are familiar with proofs like that. That's a, called a proof by induction. All right. Um, Induction is fundamental for proving theorems about the natural numbers, as well as defining basic functions on the natural numbers. Uh, and then he goes into a bit of uh, history here. <clears throat> um, we're not gonna go in depth on like building the natural numbers up from you know first principles or foundations or axioms or things like that. At least not in this book, I don't believe he does that. Uh, just so you know, he does go more in depth into this, I believe in this book. Let me just stop the screen share for a second. Uh, I, I believe he he uh, 
states that he goes more in depth into Grassman's um, development of the natural numbers in this book, Numbers and Geometry. Um, this is a book I'd uh, I'd like to advent at some point eventually to go through all of John Stilwell's books, uh, but well, I'm not going to do this one yet. Um, but I just wanted to say he does go over this topic in other books more in depth, but we're just going to talk about the basics here real quick. Um, okay, so if we assume the existence of a successor function, which is denoted like this, S of n, we define that to be n plus 1. So if n is a natural number, the successor of n is that number n plus one. So you add one to it to get the success, uh, the successor. Uh, so this give, this is going to give us a sort of inductive way of proving facts about uh, the natural numbers. So we can define the operations of addition and multiplication on n. Uh, and like I said, this treatment is uh, was given first by uh, a high school teacher, believe it or not, named Herman Grassman. Uh, he has his own book that you can still buy online. Uh, he wrote it in German uh, initially, I believe, but you can find uh, English translations of it. Unfortunately, it's not a it's not a historical book that I own, uh, but you can find copies uh, still of his book online. Uh, but anyway, this development was first developed by uh, Grassman. It was forgotten about for a while and then rediscovered by Dedekind in the, when did, I guess, 18th century? I think that's when Dedekind lived. Um, so it was discovered, forgotten about, and then rediscovered <laughs> later on. So this is a useful development of the, the, uh, um, uh, the natural numbers that it's it's modern considered modern nowadays so um anyway we can um uh, use these definitions with the successor function to get definition inductive definitions of uh addition and so and multiplication for the natural numbers so for in other words for all m and n the successor of m is n plus one uh given m plus n so if you know the number m plus n then m plus the successor of n is equal to s of m plus n. In other words, uh, m plus the successor of n is the same thing as the successor of the number m plus n. And we can do something similar for multiplication. m times 1 we define to be m. And if you know the number m times n, then we define m times the successor of n to be equal to mn plus m, which uh, is um, uh, understood. Uh, what's, what's the word? It's uh, <clears throat> Oh, it's defined, I guess, uh, because we know about addition from from these facts here. All right. So, like I said, this treatment was um, developed by Herman Grassman, uh, and later redeveloped by um, by Dedekind. Uh, so that we're not really going to do too much with this, in, in I believe in this book. But like I said, he has uh, Stillwell has other books that deal more with foundational stuff. So he does go over this more in depth than other books which hopefully eventually we'll get we'll get around to okay but anyway uh oh, did i read this part uh with these definitions we can use induction to prove all basic properties about addition and multiplication but we're not going to do that here so okay uh that's section 1.2 again continuing uh section 1.3 uh sometimes it's more convenient to work with a set of integers which we denote by that fancy looking z rather than the set of natural numbers um and we'll see some examples of that in a, in a moment. The set of integers is, is defined to be the set of natural numbers along with zero and the negatives of the, the natural numbers. So you have uh, additive an additive identity now, and you also have additive inverses. Uh, with that, with those new elements under addition, the set of integers forms something called a group, which is a type of algebraic structure. Um, I don't believe I've talked too much about groups or, or algebraic structures on uh, the channel yet, we will get to um, linear spaces or vector spaces when we, uh, in the next chapter in um, uh, Axler's linear algebra done right, that's a type of algebraic structure, but we haven't talked about groups or rings or fields really, uh, which we will do eventually though. But anyway, uh, Z forms a group under addition um, because it satisfies the axioms for a group. So let A, B, and C be integers then there's an associative law. So A plus B, if you add that those first and add C, you get the same integer as adding B plus C first and then adding A to it. 
there's also an additive additive identity, which is it, for the integers is the number zero, uh, which means, you know, if you take the number zero and add any integer to it, uh, then it doesn't change the value. So it, any integer plus zero is just the, the integer. Um, and then also we have uh, existence of additive inverses. So for any integer, there's a number that we denote. So for any integer a, we did we have an integer that we denote by negative a uh, that exists um, such that a plus negative a gives you the additive identity. So you know, like you know, four my four plus minus four is zero. So minus four is the additive inverse of four, and vice versa. So every integer has an additive inverse. Right. So with uh, since Z satisfies those three axioms, uh, we call it a group. That's those. These are the group axioms. Right. Uh, there's actually a more structure to Z than just the group structure. In fact, Z is um, an abelian group, and that's because it, in addition to the three group axioms, it satisfies the abelian property, which is a commutative law. So for any integers a and b, a plus b is b plus a. So the order that you add them in doesn't make a difference. You get the same number. Okay, uh, and actually, we could say even more about Z if we add the the operation of multiplication to it. Uh, under addition and multiplication, Z the set of integers forms what's called a ring, um, because it's an abelian group under addition. And uh, addition and multiplication are connected by a distributive property, uh, which uh, means you know for any integers a, b, and c, a times b plus c. Uh, you know, if you add b plus c first and then multiply that by A, that's the same thing as multiplying A and B and A and C and adding those things together. That's the distributive law. Uh, I'm not going to go into the ring axioms here. Uh, we will do that, I think, later on in this book. Uh, and also, you know, whenever we get around to abstract algebra, we'll talk about groups and rings in a lot of detail when we get to those those subjects in, on the channel. OK, uh, with these properties, um, this, this new algebraic structure, uh, Z is closed under not only addition and multiplication, but it's also closed under subtraction. So we're allowed to subtract integers and you stay in the integers if you subtract any two integers. Uh, the concept of group and ring came way after the idea of the set of integers. The integers were not only known in antiquity, but they were very important to uh, mathematicians in, in antiquity. Uh, but the the concept of an algebraic structure like a group or a ring or a field or a vector space, things like those were uh, 18th century st uh, stuff that was not uh, that was developed way after. OK, rings were invented, I believe, by Dedekind um, to generalize the concept of integer. In many cases, the integers simplify things. However, some things become more complicated. And he just gives an example here. Uh, so the definition of prime becomes a bit more complicated if you extend n to be, to be, uh, the set of integers. Uh, if p is prime in the, the set of integers, then the only divisors of p are plus or minus 1 or plus or minus p. So you get a slightly more complicated definition for um, <clears throat> for a prime number in z. OK, uh, an example of working where Z working with Z where it's more simple is considered below. Again, he just gives a, an example of something like that. So here, if we want to describe the numbers that have the form 4M plus 7N in two cases, one where M and N are natural numbers and case two where M and N are integers. So we'll see that uh, if M and N are integers, the description of that, that set of numbers is a lot simpler. Um, so let's start with the, the more difficult case where we allow M and N to vary over the natural numbers. So here's the description of those numbers. And I just realized I don't have the closing parentheses here. So I'll do that uh, so, or the set brackets. So the set of 4M plus 7N where M and N are natural numbers are given by this union. So you get this sort of uh, um, I guess like weird set of starting elements that you can represent that way. Uh, it contains the numbers 11, 15, 18, 19, 22, 23, 25, 26, and 27. And then once you get to 29, every number starting at 29 and above, you can represent as uh, in the form 4m plus 7n for some natural number n. So you, you kind of get this weird uh, set of like outliers i guess so, i don't know if out, outliers is probably not the right word um but this you know 
this set of just seemingly random, you know, natural numbers that you can represent that way. And then after 29, starting at 29 and after every natural number after uh, starting at 29 and after can be represented that way. Uh, and let's just show that that that's the case. Um, for the first set, you can just do it by hand. So you can just figure out, you know, what v values of M and N, they have to be natural numbers, though, uh, give you these numbers. For example, if M is 1 and N is 1, then you get 11, right? And then you could just, you know, figure out, you'll have to figure out by hand which numbers work, uh, which is tedious, but you could do it. You know, and it's not that difficult. It's just tedious. Uh, but the second set follows from the fact, from a, a, a nice fact, that if uh, since we know that uh, 29 through 32 can be represented in that form, for example, 29 is 2 times 4 plus 3 times 7, 30 is 4 times 4 plus 2 times 7, 31 is 6 times 4 times uh, plus 1 times 7, and 32 is 1 times 4 plus 4 times 7, um, then we can write all of the numbers after uh, starting at 29 and after as this union of sets here. So um, if you want to get, for example, 33, 33 belongs to this first set in this, un this set of uh, union of sets here, uh, that would be when K is one. So th in other words, 33 would be uh, three times four plus three times seven, that'll give you 33. Uh, if you want to get 34, that'll You'll, that'll be in this set where K is one. So that would be five times four plus two times seven uh, and so on and so on like that. So you can get all the numbers past um, uh, 29 by just adding, you know, one more factor of four in, in each of these cases, right? And then, you know, you start with these four and then you can get the rest of them, by, like I said, by that doing that process. Okay, um, so that, shows that you can represent every number past uh, starting at 29 and past in that form uh, for natural numbers. However, if you look at case two, where M and N are integers, it's a lot simpler. In fact, the set of all numbers of the form 4M plus 7N, where N is an integer, is the set of integers. It's the entire set of integers. You can write every integer that way. Um, and this has to do with, uh, so, uh, just as a note here, um, this has to do with uh, the concept of GCF, uh, great, greatest common factor, um, which we'll, we won't look at really here, but he does talk more about it in detail in later sections, so which we'll explore later. All right, but uh, just going through the, the the example here. So notice that you can write one, the integer one in that form. You could write it as two times four times minus one uh, plus minus one times seven, or in other words, two times four minus seven. That gives you one, right? Eight minus seven is one. So all you have to do, if you want to write any natural number, uh, sorry, any integer of that form, you just multiply that equation through by n. So you get two n times four minus seven n equals one times n, or in other words, the, the integer n can be written in this form. So you can actually write every single integer in that form. And the reason you're the reason that you can do that, just a, as a hint, is because the GCF between four and seven is one. So G, GCF four seven is one. That's why you can do that here. Uh, but like I said, we'll look more at GCFs later on. All right, so that's just one one example where you know the set of integers make things uh, a bit easier. <clears throat> All right, last section that I'll do in this video is one point four. So uh, if a divides b, then we say a uh, b is equal to a times q for some q in z. However, if a does not divide b, then we'll be interested in the quotient and the remainder of b when we divide by a. So the quotient q is the largest integer q a such that QA is less than or equal to B. And the remainder, uh, you know, if A does not divide evenly into B, will be B minus that number QA. Remember QA, we're defining the quotient here as the, the largest number QA that uh, um, is less than or equal, the largest integer QA that's less than or equal to B. 
Okay, um, the remainder R may be found by repeatedly subtracting A from B to get a sequence of natural numbers. So B times B minus A times B minus two times B minus three A and, and so on and so on like that. Um, this sequence of natural numbers necessarily has to terminate because of the fact that the, the natural numbers are well ordered. So it has to terminate by descent because these are natural numbers, they're all positive, right? Um, so the remainder then um, is it will have to be greater than or equal to uh, zero and strictly less than B. And there's a picture here just illustrating the geometry be behind why this works. Let me actually just draw in the number line. It might make it a little bit easier to understand what this picture is showing. So this is the number line here. I'll draw it in blue. Right, so the blue line is the number line. So this distance here is the equal to the number a, right? The distance is the number a, uh, and we can you know add another a to it to get to two a, and so on and so on. Uh, this distance here is also has distance a. So this is um, the lower number here is q times a. The upper number here is q plus one times a, and the number b, if if a does not divide evenly into b, will be somewhere in between you know the product of two uh, multiples of a, right? So b is somewhere inside of this interval, and the remainder r is the distance from q a to b. So you would r is b minus q a, in other words. So that's just a way of visualizing this uh, geometrically on the number line. Okay, uh, he says uh, important here. So I just copied what he said. The main purpose of division with remainder is to find the remainder when, uh, which tells us when uh, A divides B or when A does not divide B. So just as an example here, just writing the fraction B over A doesn't tell us if A divides B or not. For example, if you have a comp two complicated numbers, and again, there's a typo here. <laughs> Let me fix this real quick before I explain. Sorry, this should not be Q, this should be Z. So let me just fix this. Okay, so it's just writing B over A doesn't tell us if A divides B. For example, uh, it's not clear whether four, th uh, four, three, five, six, zero, zero, two, nine divided by seven, 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 seven is an integer or not. In other words, it's not clear whether that the de the denominator divides evenly into the numerator, uh, and that's because the numbers are kind of complicated, right? It's hard to see just by looking at the fraction. So what we need is the the remainder. Uh, and there's a couple of ways we could do that. We can do the, you know, the, the complete division here. Um, four, three, five, six, zero, zero, two, nine is equal to 560 times 77,777 plus 4909. That, so that number that I have circled there is the remainder. Notice it's not zero. So now we know that um, the fraction that I have written above is not an integer. So in other words, 77,777 does not divide evenly into 4356 0029. All right, uh, another way we could do this, whoops, uh, didn't mean to do that. Another way we can do this is, you know, either use a numerical method or a calculator or something to get the decimal. So if you type that in, you get a decimal representation 560, um, point zero six three one dot 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 it goes on uh, for a while um, the remainder the way you, you would get the remainder here is you would take the number itself four three five six zero zero two nine and subtract the whole number part times the divisor so the whole number part meaning the part to the left of the decimal place so you take the number minus 560 times 7, 77,777. And that'll give you the remainder. This is R. And again, notice it's not zero. So, you know, you could see that either way. Um, so that's that's um, an important thing to be aware of. We're, we're interested in quotients and remainders when the numbers are not, don't divide evenly into each other. Okay, um, that's that's essentially section 1.4. So uh, I'm gonna stop this video here and do the exercises for those four sections. Let me stop the screen share. Uh, I'll, I'll post that right after I post this one. Um, and then, you know, sometime soon I'll, I'll finish up chapter one because I've actually done everything in chapter one already. I just haven't written up the summary, the chapter summary, sorry, the section summaries for each of the other 
um, sections yet. Uh, but the, all the exercises I finished a, a long time ago. Um, all right, I'll see you guys in the next video. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, do take a look at the Patreon and consider joining. Um, again, it's only $5 a month and you'd be uh, supporting the channel by doing that. And you'll also be getting uh, loads of uh, good content and content over on the Patreon page to, uh, as well. I'll see you guys in the next video. Until that time, keep learning and I'll see you guys in the next one.